Everybody, welcome back to Final Residence TV in episode number 21 of Van Halen Stories, actually 22, 22 of Van yeah. Halen Stories with Kurt James, our first California interview mm. on this trip to L.A. Kurt uh, was with Alcatraz as well as with Steeler, right? Well, actually, Steeler, yes, but I toured with Graham Bonnet doing the 35-year anniversary of the Alcatraz record. Okay, so the, the first record. Yeah, so it was 35 years later that I played all the songs on tour all over Europe. Right, Island in the Sun and all that. Yeah, fun <laughs> stuff. I love those records. I love that record. Oh, too. wasn't that a great one when it dropped? That thing was like a, wow. another game changer. Some of my favorite Ingve stuff is on that. I Basically. Mean, yeah, it is really clean and... You were, I guess you've probably seen the Japanese uh, bootleg that was out for a long time. With That's Ingve. great, yeah. With that. Yeah, it's a killer, killer one. Anyway... Kurt is a monster Van Halen fan like the rest of us, but he had the distinct advantage of seeing Van Halen at the Pasadena Civic. Yeah. <clears throat> and you'd heard about him before. Right. Prior. Tell, tell me about a little bit about when that started for you with Van Halen, the first time you ever heard about him, and then, you know, your path to seeing him live. Well, I grew up in South Pasadena, and in junior high school, they, we had these lockers, you know, they were uh, yay big and... They would shove flyers like in the edge of there. So you'd, in between classes, you open up your locker, and all of a sudden this Van Halen flyer falls out. So I probably started getting those flyers in around 1975, 76, in there. Mm -hmm. And um, then uh, a friend of mine was coming off the gym field, and I was going, like we were crossing paths between gym class, right. and he's going, like like doing these David Lee Roth screams, yelps and stuff. I go, hey man, what, what's up with that? Why are you doing that? He goes, oh, because this was like the first day, like back to school, you know. And he goes, <laughs> oh, over the summer I saw this band Van Halen and the singer was going, ow, ow, you know, all the time. And then so that was probably the first real thing that I remember, you know, right. hearing about yeah, him. Like, yeah. Direct, you know, like right? That. And yeah. you've been playing guitar since you or started playing when you were really young. Um, you said what, ten? Before, before? Yeah, but I, I started taking it seriously at the age of twelve, and that was when everything was happening. Uh, Blow by Blow had just come out by Jeff Beck. Uh, Hendrix was on the cover of Guitar Player magazine five years after he died. So that was like nineteen seventy-five. You know, yeah. so I, I was actually, you know deeply into electric guitar playing already yeah at 12 years old yeah. right right yeah so who was your favorite guy then well back then um obviously hendrix was you know well known and great but the guy that really i was paying attention to because everyone loved you know zeppelin right right pink floyd and, and the who and all that but I was into um, Bachman Turner Overdrive. Oh, really? Okay. Because Randy would do these jazz songs, kind of mixed in with the heavy metal, mm -hmm. and there'd be like this bebop stuff out of the blue on this song, Welcome Home. Mm -hmm. And then there's another song called um, Blue Collar, which I think is a, that's on the first BTO record, and mm -hmm. it's, it's a jazz masterpiece, you know, for a pop metal group. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. And so I, I dug that. That's cool that they ended up, you know, touring with Van Halen too. Later yeah, on, later, right. Later on, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, I was into Jeff Beck, John McLaughlin, Al DiMiola, Larry Carlton. You know, there was more of a jazz fusion headspace, like with the guys that I was hanging out with. I know. guess. Okay. So going back to Van Halen, you're in South Pasadena. In this first, you know, inkling about the band from your friend, and then. How, what happens next? You know, the you you're familiar with all of the places like we were talking about earlier. The the sound chamber, which is where mm -hmm. the Spanish oh, Arctic. I used to go to the sound chamber once a week, almost religiously. You know, right. and um, uh, Pooh Bob Records was another place that you know we would go. Like, of course, we didn't have a car, so me and my buddy would like grab our skateboards 
And it was, it was about three miles or so, you know, and we'd just go to Pasadena like on a Saturday morning, you know, and make the rounds. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but uh, well, as far as, as Van Halen, you know, I we knew, everybody knew about him, but there were so many other bands that, you know. Like how many bands were in this in the Pasadena area at the time, do you think? Gosh, at least about 20. Wow. You know what I mean? Wow. I mean, it was a scene, and, and the guitar playing was pretty competitive, you know. So I had heard about Edward, and, and people showed me tapping and stuff, you know. So it, it wasn't like a complete surprise, you know. Right. When I actually did finally see him at the... Civic Center mm -hmm. Exhibition Hall. Right, right. But what I did come away with that was how clear the guitar jumped out of the mix compared to any other band I'd seen. Okay. Since I was already in the Al Di Miola and John McLaughlin and other, you know, like very quick, you know, mm -hmm. agile guitar players, I wasn't blown away so much by the technique, but just said how clear it came across. Right, right. We think that was the, the, the amp, the clarity of his his attack, or what, what do you think was the contributing factor? It all was, it, all well, it. obviously his playing is very, you know... Articulate. Yeah, articulate at that time. And in the mix, you know, by then, you know, I've, I've been told by, you know, now that I've met a lot of people that were involved with the band, um, that that was a special showcase. They had a much better PA. Mm -hmm. They had their own... Sound man, and they really were. Yeah, at its height. Yeah, they were very, um, you know, into it. You know, making it sound great. You know. Yeah, I think I've heard that before. That that, that varied. I think you know, we, some of the other people that in that circle of people you're talking to that I've talked to said the same thing. It varied on the sound system, how well, how, what it sounded like. Yeah. And then the Civic being such a crazy room as far as acoustically, you know. Yeah, it was like a huge bomb shelter or something. Just right. Right. Just concrete walls and just... <laughs> so it took a lot to be heard clearly there because everything was bouncing around, you know? Right, right. And, and I, you know, the, I'm going to clarify with this with you, and I've clarified it with, clarified with other people. All the shows were in the exhibition hall, never in the theater. As far as I know. That's what most people say. You know, I mean, I saw them there. Right, you know? right. You saw them there. So, right. and, the, and so, so there were also always other bands. Mm-hmm. And the way it's been described to me was they'd be set up on different sides of the room or the ends of the room, and Van Halen would be like at one end. Terry. What I do remember clearly about that show is Terry Kilgore opened up. Okay. And he had a, like a conga player with him, mm -hmm. blonde-haired guy. And he was playing a Les Paul through an Echoplex, lots of echo. And that, I thought that was kind of like way too much, you know, mm -hmm. for a... <laughs> a room that's already you know, already red. echoey, you know. Yeah. So it was just a wash, you know. So I was like, mm, okay, that's all right. And then, so they were set up like as you go in, they were like the first band. And then I remember Smokehouse was over here, mm -hmm. and so there was like at least three stages that I remember clearly. Right. And you know, Van Halen was at the back of the room. Against the wall, they had the big stage. You right, know? right, right. Yeah. yeah, Smokehouse, that would have been October. You, we talked about this mm -hmm. earlier. October right. 15th show or whatever. Well, it was. there you go. Yeah, that was the, <laughs> yeah. Is, it, is it the last show or not? Because there's one listed for December. but Right, were, I heard there was one, even though they said that was the farewell <laughs> concert, like right. on the flyers, that there was actually another one. One other show. Yeah, yeah that's what I heard too. So... Talk about when you go to this show, and, and you know you said the, the articulation, but just tell me just your general impressions of, of this show, where you were at, how far you were back, and all that stuff. Well, um, I think I was, like, moving around, you know, listening to different, you know, right. like trying to find the sweet spot, you know, right, where right. the guitar was just cutting through. Right. But I remember being pretty close up front, and when they started playing I'm the One, <laughs> and, and I'm like right in front of Dave, and he's swinging his swiveling his hips, right, right, and he's singing "I'm the one, the one you love," and I'm like looking at him, going, "Nope, <laughs> <laughs> you're not the one I love," but you know, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, I kind of 
kind of crazy. But you know that he swivels his hips in the You Really Got Me video. Oh, yeah. You know, that's, that's, that's just kind of shocking for a 15 year old kid, you know, who's never seen anything like that before. Right. Right, right but he kind of, kind of, that kind of got lost. Oh, it grew on, it grew, <laughs> it grew, you know, I got it later. But, but yeah, but, but yeah. he kind of, he kind of, kind of calmed certain aspects down. Like, <laughs> like that oh, might have, like somebody might have said, hey, that's a little too much. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. But yeah, it's in the videos, in the early videos yeah. at the whiskey. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So you're moving around and I'm the one hit you pretty hard. Um, well, I, I definitely remember that lyric cause, cause, and, and just the feeling that I had <laughs> right. from seeing that. You right. know? Like, oh, my but, God. But what I do remember that is when Ed's doing the, the, the eruption solo, somebody on the side of the stage, the, the bomb was on like, like a wheel cart or something. And somebody was like pulling it with a rope. So here he is, he's like jamming away, and the bomb just starts coming from the side of the stage closer to him, closer and closer. Really? And finally, yeah, it finally turns around and starts, you know, fooling with the echoes and stuff. But that was, I do remember that. Actually, the bomb moving across so the that's stage. That's cool. Now, I never heard that. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty cool. You know, one of the, one of the other guests said that the bomb was, or, or things like the bomb became... Um, like they would have their own little version of this bomb thing. Like there'd be racks, but they would be like uh, Carlos Carbazo had had something where he had a mannequin and he had. Oh right, yeah, yeah, yeah. that was true because you know the echo plex was kind of an ungainly thing. Didn't really fit on anything. And, and there was there was two echoes that were basically being utilized even by Ed at that concert, and it, the echo plex, you know, the maestro echo plex. Right. Right. But in the bomb, it was a, a Univox. univox yeah whatever EC, 80 yeah, yeah yeah ec 80 yeah yeah those things are yeah i saw one today and the, yeah they're tiny actually yeah so they fit in there mm -hmm. you know <laughs> yeah you could you could yeah yeah and he had two of them and you know i've owned probably five or six of those through the years and mm -hmm. they are the most cantankerous noisy unreliable mm -hmm. you know i think he had two of them in there just because for a backup or something um but I know that, uh, well, I've heard that Jose mm -hmm. would get in there and put a better motor and, you know, kind of beef it up and make it sound better than, than what it came with, okay. you know, factory stock, you know. Well, speaking of, of, of stuff, like gear stuff, we, I just wonder, well, I remember this and you just said this. They're, all the Van Halen nuts are going to go crazy over this. But the speakers, like you said earlier, he had Celestians and what? <laughs> Oh, uh, the the famous one that everyone thinks are JBLs were actually from Radio Shack. <laughs> yeah. You heard it from Kurt James. It's all his fault. Sorry. Because <laughs> people are going to lose their shit over that. Yeah. And, and if you look, there's that one picture at Sunset Sound where they're recording, and he's playing through a slant cabinet. Mm -hmm. And those supposed JBLs are in a straight cabinet. So obviously he wasn't. And if you listen to the two mic sounds, mm -hmm. it really sounds like one's just closer to the center and one's closer to the, you know, edge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're, they're, they're not that different. One's just a little brighter than the other. JBLs would sound completely different, like ice picks. And and that's, you just, no. Wow. Wow. <laughs> not into that. You know, wow, that wasn't man, the thing. That's wild. In, in fact, he was chasing after the 20 watt Celestians. And I do have one cabinet mm -hmm. that has, you know, the all original 20. And I must say, they're a little sparklier, a little tighter, mm -hmm. very musical, hmm. very cool. I mean, one of my favorite cabinets of all time. Wow. For sure. Yeah, we were, you know, we are talking about the, the the music store there in town. There was Dr. Music as well, which I, I don't know much about that. Do you have much? Well, I'd been there... Uh, a few times. It was actually farther from South Pasadena, closer to Arcadia or something like mm -hmm. that, Hastings Ranch. And it was kind of more like a Wallach's Music City. I don't know if that means anything to you, but more, it wasn't like, Sound Chamber was focused on guitars and amps, and that's about it. Right. Where Dr. Music, you know, you could rent band instruments and stuff like that. Right, so it was a, like a multiple instrument. Yeah. Yeah, we call it a full line. Is yeah, what we there called you it go. at one time. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The so the the sound chamber, which I think I found today. Mm. Um, what was it like inside? Well, I mean, I, I saw the room today. Yeah, it was actually two rooms. Okay, and and it 
kind of like a glass storefront door in the center. You walk in. On the left is the the sales counter. It have guitars hanging up there, mm -hmm. and then along the opposite wall were lots of guitars. And then you go through a door into the other room where they had amps. So it's pretty much electric guitars or some acoustics? There's some acoustics, but they were really, you know, catering to the electric guitar player. They had all the pedals. I remember I got my first Ibanez Super 70 pickup that I put in my first electric guitar. Right. At Sound Chamber, yeah. And it was a zebra, like a black and white one. Yeah, that's that's wild because, you know, I was talking about the, the pickups in the original Shark. Mm -hmm. would have been super 70s everybody talks about that or whether it was a paf that he stole or whatever so the destroyers in particular you know this is something i've been chasing we, we've talked about on the side about the woods mm -hmm. you know whether it was carino whether it was ash you know you have a couple of these things right now now as far as i know um the very the sound chamber was uh the main place to get your ibanezes and grecos and stuff like that so the very first ones to come out, like in late 74, early 75, were actually mahogany Grecos. Okay. And then the pre-serial number ones came out with um, Japanese ash called sen wood. Right. And in around 76, you could get ones that were a little beefier and the grain was totally different, more like an American ash that you get on like a... 70s Stratocaster. Right. And, and one thing, I was just listening to a, an interview. I think it was the, uh, the one of the full-length interviews that just came out. Mm -hmm. And he goes, uh, Edward's talking about woods. And he goes, like the, the Strats had, he called it an inferior wood, like alder. But the Charvel body was ash. And he said that was superior. Mm -hmm. And then later on, the same thing in the same interview he goes yeah you know some the ivan is uh destroyer you know the some of them were ash and those were the turkeys so in the same interview he like says ash is great for the strap but the ash was the turkey on the destroyer so yeah right. go figure you right know? i you know because in that i think the interview you're talking about with uh, josh yeah Albrecht, he says the first ones that came over were Carina, and then they changed them to Ash. Right. It, which was, I don't know if that's it correct. I, you know, we we we're pretty much everybody, even EVH, I think, is said it's been Ash, and then they're talking yeah. about working with Japan in the coming year mm -hmm. for a new product from the same factory that built these guitars. So, you know, the, all the Japanese-made instruments came from that same factory. The same people are going to build the new some some of the new EVH products. Oh, I see, yeah. So they're going to do some of that. But they, they had mentioned in the article that it was the same factory, yeah. same people that built the Ibanez. Now, now as far as I know, and yeah. I, I believe this to be true, that Ibanez never actually made a Carina wood. Right, it's... Which Lim is the African limbo. Limbo, yeah. Limbo, yeah, yeah. So yeah. they were always maple, three-piece maple necks. Okay with a multiple pancake like uh body yeah yeah every once in a while there'd be more like a one or two piece body that i've heard of but right, right. but you know basically everyone i've ever seen it's a multi-piece yeah blend. like like even down the middle this way and then this way yeah yeah so it's like five or six pieces of wood yeah yeah and that was a problem with limbo is that at least what I've read over the years is that limbo is just hard to get big pieces mm. and to do an explorer with right. limbo is difficult. Same thing with uh, the V, you know, even though mm -hmm. you still have to have a pretty big piece of wood to do it right. to get that kind of thing. But otherwise you got to do two piece or three piece or whatever. Yeah. The V's were typically two piece with the, <coughs> yeah, with the split. Like yeah, yeah. 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 And yeah. So yeah. When, you know, the whole Karina thing, when he said that years ago and you know, that, that interview goes back to 80, I think it was. So you know when I'm I'm learning to play guitar, I'm hearing about Karina wood or you know whatever. I'm, I'm, this is the wood. It's got to be. You really got me, man. I, that's yeah. the sound, right? I, right. So I got to have Karina, and or, or Limba, and of course I bought nothing. You know, like a few Karina, and they do have a thing. 
they do have a cut and a and a and a vibe that that's different. Oh, you mean you bought a Gibson Carino? I have, yeah, I have a Carino. Like v. the '83 reissue. Yeah, or something? I, have, I, have a, I have an Explorer and a V. Oh, nice. Yeah, and they got the. I would like to check those dude, out. Dude, <laughs> they're beautiful and they sound un- unbelievable. All right. Well, the guy we were talking about earlier from Alice Cooper has a '83. No, he has a. Yeah, he has a custom shop one, mm. and then he has that destroyer like yours. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, they have a the, the Carina does have a thing. It's lighter, you know. It has a little cut. It's um, it's not as it's tight in the bottom. You don't get that flub. Right. Although you know, I guess it just depends on the pickup and whatever you got going on. But but I don't know if the what do you think about the wood debate? Whether the wood makes that huge a difference or it's more it's than, all about the wood. Yeah. You know, you can change anything, but you can't really change the wood, can you? Right. You can change the frets, the pickups, the pots, right. tuners. But if that wood ain't working, right, right, you're screwed. You're screwed. <laughs> you gotta get rid of that guitar. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that know. one's gotta go. Yeah, <laughs> and it's and it's weird because what I found is you can sit there by yourself and play it acoustically and go, oh, I like this, and then you plug it in, and you go, oh, I like it. But then when you show up at rehearsal, it's, ooh, it's, it's not it. happening. All right, that's you it. know. And then that one you thought was like not that great. Is like working, you know what I mean? <laughs> so it's, it's really comes down to the rehearsal room or live on stage, whatever works. You know? So you think like with the, uh, with like those guys with Van Halen, they kind of, you know, Alex had a sound, you know, and he had a sound he was going for, and you know, you know this, plan for as long as you do. When you're in a band, like you're saying, not working in a band. Mm-hmm. It's about how all that sits together right. in the end. So your guitar might not, oh, by itself, of course, might not be the thing, right? Or it might be a different wood or whatever. Well, yeah. I mean, my point is, is like the guitar that you think is going to be great might not work in that live situation. Right. And I've ha- I put things together or, or grabbed onto something and I go, it sounds a little, I don't know, like this is not the best thing guitar. But then you're playing it with the band, and it just sits in the mix. It feels great. It stays in tune. Right. You know, it fills up the room. Right. Right. You know, so it's it's kind of tricky. You know, yeah, it is tricky. So the in Pasadena, as this Van Halen thing was happening, mm. I mean, like, what was the? Did everybody know that they were going to be superstars? Or mm, you, no? You, know, you kind of said this earlier. That it was yeah. No. Like, I mean, it, it was there were so many bands. I mean, and they were one of many, but they were. Probably the most well-known band, but you never think that the band up the street that plays locally is going to become the next Led Zeppelin, or and and the guitar player is going to become the next superhero of right. guitar. Right. You know, it's just you can't like wrap your head around that. Yeah, I mean that's just like <laughs> what really, but obviously it did happen, and then it became like like yeah. You know, that's our band. Oh, that yeah. was, that's like the guys that, you know, played up the street or played, you know what I mean? Played sure. in those backyard parties. And, right, right. And then now they're making it. And it's like it made you think that you had a chance too. Well, know? that's true. That was a thing back then. I mean, you were talking about competitiveness in the bands. Now, this is the big, one of the big debates. And Greg Leon, who who was on the show as well, talked about Quiet Riot. Mm-hmm. He, he says there wasn't a competitive thing between Van Halen and quite right yet chris holmes says there was hmm. and then there's a documentary out that says randy rhodes was very competitive you think it was competitive or you think it was just like you know of course you want to do well and you want right. to be good in your in your in your class and focus around town. well you know it's there was definitely clicks you know like little like okay there was the south pasadena click that there's a few guitar players and i was one of them and that like blends into the Pasadena and then it, Glendale, you know, it depends like who's the king of their high school, right, who's right, the king right. of of that city, whether it's Sierra Madre, like Terry Kilgore is like the Sierra Madre guy, okay, okay. you know, and and Denny Berry was one of the guys that was like in the, in the mix, you know. Right, right. And, but there was different scenes because there was the jazz fusion guys. And then there was the like rock guys that had no jazz fusion chops at all. <laughs> right, right. You right. know, so <laughs> so to me, you know, growing up with the jazz fusion like thing, right, it was like 
a lot of rock bands to me were just like nothing that I was really concerned with or paying attention to. Right, right. You know, it's like I was waiting for the next Larry Carlton or Aldi Miola record to come out. You know, so you just wouldn't like you know weren't paying a huge amount of attention except to like Van Halen when they blew up. Is that, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so the Hollywood scene, and they're they're moving to that scene. I mean, what? At what point did you were you involved in that scene, Starwood? All of Actually, that? I played at Gazarius quite a bit. Did you? Is that um, early, early days when they did? Uh, not that early. Yeah. But um, I never did make it to the Starwood. You know, I didn't have a car back then, and it was gone by the by. Not, yeah. Uh, but point. but by the time. You know, I was out there doing my thing, you know. Gazaris was somewhere I played a bunch of times. Yeah. Know? So what would you think of the room? It sounded okay. They, it kind of changed. They, you mean, know? they changed the room around, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, I definitely played the Roxy, the Whiskey, mm -hmm. the Troubadour, uh, in different places. Which one know? did you like the acoustics in best? Mm. Let's see. Probably <clears throat> the Roxy. But the, no, actually, the Palladium. Okay. The Palladium was a bigger room. Right, right. And that was the first room I played where I had a 100-watt head, no master volume, on 10, oh, and it wasn't loud enough. <laughs> right on the stage, right? Yeah. I mean, it just, the curtains and everything just soaked up that sound. That ruled, though, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, it was like, it's a good thing they had a mic on it and a monitor over here, you know? As far as you said that, you know, the the... The Gazzaris and all that. How long were you in that scene? I mean, you. This is where you kind of like. Steeler was a band you took kind of took Ingve's spot from. You ended up taking over that. that right. Yeah. I, I I was actually um, the one signing the records when we did the in stores. You know, it'd be Ingve's picture, and then <laughs> sometimes like do a little doodle and write Kurt James, and but um. See, basically what happened is I grew up in South Pasadena. Right. And then once I, I graduated from high school, uh, I moved in with my father, because my parents had split up, um, in Orange County. Okay. So when I joined Steeler, I was actually in Orange County in 83. Okay. And I was playing backyard parties mainly. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I, I, that happened uh, when I was 19, which was a couple years earlier than that, is um, I got um, a gig in Las Vegas playing the Tropicana six nights a week, two shows. Wow. I had to join the Musicians Union, and the artist was affiliated with Frank Sinatra. Oh, wow. So at our first show, when I did my guitar solo, Got a standing ovation. Frank Sinatra was in the audience. <laughs> wow. Yeah, so I can say I played a show, you know. <laughs> with Frank Sinatra. Yeah, with Frank Sinatra That's there. Pretty, that was kind of cool. That's pretty cool. So tell me some of these other uh, Van Halen tidbits that you uh, that you picked up over the years, stories. and. Well, I'd, I'd say the main thing happened in 1980. That was probably the greatest thing, you know, regarding Van Halen. Um so my drummer and I, you know, we didn't have a gig. It's it's uh, Fourth of July. We typically would have a gig, and we're at uh, the apartment complex where my I lived with my father, and we're at the pool, just kind of lounging around, wondering what we're gonna do. And my my dad like yells across because it was quite a ways from the balcony to the pool area, and, and he goes, "Van Halen's in Laguna Beach." And I'm like, what? So I had a friend that lived in Laguna Beach. And so we like scramble, you know, I get on the phone and I talk to my buddy. He goes, yeah, Van Halen's at Vacation Village today. And we're all like, whoa. So I call my, my uh, guitar tech. who had, I didn't even drive yet, you know. And uh, so we hop in the truck and I bring my acoustic guitar. We head down to Laguna Beach, Vacation Village, and I'm walking in, and then I see this brown Porsche 911 Targa, and I look in there, and I see, like, guitar player magazines and some other stuff. I go, that's that's got to be Edward's, you know, <laughs> Ed, Eddie's car. Right. 
And then, so, wow, that was, like, already cool. Right. And then, um, and we kind of, like, sneak around, and I see this guy with bushy hair, like, sunbathing, like, on a lounge, you know, kind of flat. Somehow, like, we're going, hey, it's that, that's, that's, that's probably him. And then, um, he looks, like, he kind of, like, rolls over and looks at us, and he's got this lion manes of hair, and the two most blazing green eyes i've ever seen like i guess the sun had supercharged his eyes or something but it was just like that was like bolts of lightning you know wow and it's just like oh crap you know we don't want to bug him so i think we just kind of scurried away or right. something you know and then um later on I, I tried to talk to him while he was walking with his girlfriend before valerie right and um and uh, I, he goes uh do you mind like, like he's got his arm around the girl, and, he, and it's like, you know, I have my guitar, my acoustic guitar, and do you mind? And I'm all like, oh, shit, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so it's just like, okay, so me and my buddy walk this way, and then Ed and the girl walk this way. But somehow, I have no idea how this happened. I'm walk We're walking this way, kind of like disappointed, you know? Me and my buddy also played guitar. He was the one that, you know, called my dad. And uh, then I hear this, hey, kid, let me see that. Like, what? And then we, I, we look over, and sitting on the rocks was Edward and his girlfriend. And it's just like, hey, kid, let me see that. He's just like, whoa. So we go over, <laughs> and I hand him, you know, my acoustic, and he starts playing. He starts doing Spanish Fly and Eruption and stuff, but the Spanish Fly was like the new thing, right? Right, right. And I had the nylon string, and he's doing this. And the one thing I remember is that he would do a pull-off or a hammer-on behind his right. hand. Right, right. Doodle, 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 and then doodle, doodle, you know. Okay. Yeah, so that was cool. Right. I do remember that. Right, you know, he does that thing where he reaches, he, uh, well, when you're, at the end of Unchained, where he reaches behind and then bars behind it. Oh, okay. You know, you remember that thing that it started in the, I don't know if that's where it came from or whatever, but people would reach, like Jakey e. Lee, or they would reach behind their fretted hand with their Yeah, well, hand. well, typically I would use that as a mute so I could right, play right, legato. Right, right, right. But this was actually a hammer. He was having behind it. Yeah, so it was like hit it, open, and then hammer, hammer. Hit it, open, hammer, hammer, diddle, 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 diddle. Because yeah. I always thought it was, you know, like this, but it was actually like that. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. This is a secondhand, one of the secondhand stories. Right. But um, a buddy of mine went to school with Eddie in, in same class, same everything. And he, one of the things he'd tell me is that that Alex would, would like, ambush him and steal his lunch buddy <laughs> like, i've heard that before yeah like i've I, heard that before. really <laughs> yeah i heard that yeah so they were they were you know the mean streets were for real man back then. right right but uh anyway so they're in class and you know my buddy is in the class with edward and out this window there was a you know the flagpole and it gets hit by lightning and it goes kabam and it scares everybody to death but it it somehow supercharged Eddie. Like, he started taking everything seriously. Like, I could have died, you know? It's like, I got to make this count, you know? And he said, ever since then, like, there was Edward before and Edward after. That's crazy. Yeah, right? Yeah, that's the story we were talking about earlier. Yeah, oh, okay, that's, yeah. that's wild. You said that was at his uh, middle school, right? I think so. It's called Marshall. Okay. I think it's a junior high, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's wild, you know. The the guy had such an effect on so many people. I mean, when you think about him, do you think you think about him like in the Hendrix realm? Mm -hmm. And you're, you know. Yeah. Was, if Hendrix was one of the contemporary or the oh, people definitely, that you grew up listening to. Oh, definitely, of course, man. I mean, like, like even for me personally, I was more into jazzy guitar players like George Benson, and I played in the high school jazz band, and we played on Broadway, and I was scat scene and stuff. I thought I was going to be a jazz fusion guitar player. Right. But then when I saw the impact that Van Halen had when that record dropped and and the magazine started coming out, it's just it was infectious. You just wanted 
to be part of that. You just want you know to emulate that. Right. You know? So when the first record came out, where where were you, and what was the first song you heard? And well, you know? I remember I was in my buddy's '69 Mustang, Mach One. We're driving up Fremont, past Huntington Drive, and Running with the Devil came on, and it was like, whoa. That's Van Halen, you know, crank it up, you know. Right. But, I mean, I remember it was the first time we actually heard him on the radio. Do you remember hearing that song live, though, before that? with the, the Well, I remember, you know, hearing it when I saw him, you know. Yeah. But uh, it wasn't like, that was before we had any bootleg tapes, you know. Right, right. You know. So, right. so not really, you know. I mean, that came out, and that was cool, and then you really got me. and Eruption. Yeah. I think. My band was the first band to be do a Van Halen tribute in Southern California. Yeah, you were telling me about this. Tell 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 them about what you do. What do you mean? Well, well, I mean you do something different with it. Oh well, yeah, but I'm talking about back in 1980. Okay, you were doing it then. Yeah, and then so we we you know we kind of modeled ourselves after Van Halen. You know, a lot of stage running around and mm -hmm. and you know totally into it. You know, high energy and. And um, this uh, promoter was called Slammer Productions. Okay. And they go, well, you guys are so into Van Halen and you guys sound so good at it. Why don't you just do like the first, I remember the first flyer that came out, they go, a salute. They called it a salute instead of a tribute. Mm -hmm. You know, we were called The Source. And they go, The Source, a salute to Van Halen at the Hideaway Cafe mm -hmm. in Santa Ana, California. And that was like 1980. Wow. So did you keep doing that through the years? or? Well, on and off. Yeah. yeah. yeah on and off, here and there. And, and uh, actually, if you trace the lineage of the Atomic Punks, mm -hmm. it, it actually started with, with me. Okay. Wow. Yeah, because um, Scott Patterson was in my band and, and John Billings. Those are the original rhythm section of the Atomic Punks. But you, didn't, you did the rare bootleg songs that were never released right yeah and and because we had access to the original tapes uh and it was so inspiring because you know you wish they'd put out so many more records than than what's the original six yeah right right but they actually had like 30 other great songs that were never really put out on records you know right, right. and and so i go what the heck you know I started showing them to people, and and we started playing them, and it just felt really good. It was it was a way to get the band to be tight and play some really cool songs quickly. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You know, instead of like, well, sit here and write originals that are half-ass. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just like, no, learn these five or ten unreleased Van Halen songs and we'll go out and kill it. You know right, what I mean? Get out, get out and play. Yeah. Right. So it's like they'd go, whoa, how did you write such killer songs? <laughs> and, right. and it's like, we never heard those before. It's like, oh yeah, they're original <laughs> written by somebody else. Right? But they are originals. Right? right. Every song is original. Maybe you didn't write it. You know? Wow, there's so many cool, you're right, there's so many cool songs on those records, uh, on those demos. Right. And, and the live bootlegs, you know, I think my first one I had was the one that you were at. Oh. It was October 15th, you know, there was that one that went around, it was in the early 90s. Mm hmm And my buddies got it, and I heard it, man. I was like, dude, I gotta have this, whatever, and then we gotta trade this tape, man. Well, even if you're playing Somebody Get Me a Doctor, you gotta do the, uh, the intro, which mm -hmm. is not on the thing, in the extended lead. Right. You know, and it's like a whole, like, a lot more information there. Right, right. Yeah. Man. That was an amazing, they're amazing band. Now, going through Broth, you know, you saw him in the early days. He said that he was, you know, gyrating or whatever. What did you, I mean, what did you think of him when you first saw him? Well, like I said, it was kind of a shocking presentation. Because you, you know, didn't really, like, know Jim Dandy or... or well, no, I did know okay. Jim Dandy. Right. So, yeah, I go, yeah, he, he looks almost identical to Jim Dandy. Right. I spotted that right off. Okay. And, um, yeah, because my, my family, my, my dad and my stepmother were way into music, you know. So they would let me st stay up on the weekends and we watched 
Don Kirshner's and, yeah, and what, you know. Yeah, I love those. What one. was the other one? Yeah, Midnight, Midnight Special. Special. Yeah. yeah. So I, I would watch those, and we definitely saw Jim Danny to the Rescue mm -hmm. and and uh, Hot and Nasty. I remember that song. <laughs> but, I mean, yeah, so the, there was definitely instant recognition. Oh, he's a, you know, Jim Dandy mm -hmm. guy. Right, you know? right, right. But, actually, I like his 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 uh interaction with the audience and his the tone of his voice back then and those screams i really think he invented a whole different way of of singing right that had really never been done before with the hitting the two notes like the yeah, weird at the same time right yeah I yeah remember, like, the little screech yeah so his screeches and screams and his low power and and his raps and everything definitely when you look at it and during that time period when he was on, he was definitely the premier frontman of rock and roll, like of all time. You like think well, like the uh, they, you know, they kind of created this thing where the, I call it the big ending or the big beginning, like with eruption. Although that came from probably the Cactus record or whatever. Yeah, you know? listen to that. Right. Cactus is right. the same the intro. Thing. Yeah, right, right, the same intro. But like we're hot for teachers, say when when you get into these big long endings and there are these drawn out things. This is something that you saw play out through the '80s with the Scorpions and mm. and all these bands where you you, you know. You'd, I guess in classical music, we might have a similar kind of thing where at the end of a song, it's kind of a free-for-all, but... It's called a cadenza. Yeah. <laughs> a technical term. Right? Yeah. You should know that if you're your ring bass replacement. Oh, shit. <laughs> right? Yeah, I guess. <laughs> but, you know, yeah, it's something that they stylized. They had a lot of little things, like with Roth, with his little raps mm -hmm. between, you know, in the songs where he made up those lines and stuff. Those became like things you expect on the next record sort of like what's he going to do now what's going to be the yeah. next little rap or the next little guitar solo that Eddie's going to do now that was actually something that I looked forward to you know when whenever the um, a new Van Halen record would come out it's like what is the solo thing going to be and I want to be the first person to learn that to, to be able to play <laughs> and show it to everybody it's like I remember going to GIT, you yeah. know, and that was right around the time when uh, Fair Warning came out. You know, so I had the intro to Mean Streets mm -hmm. and um, a few of the other tricks, you know. So but, hard, so hard to uh, have done that, though, at the time, because as I've said multiple times on here, we didn't have anything to watch, except for if you could catch it live and you could be up close, mm -hmm. you can maybe, like, figure the, I mean, you know, how did you figure that out if you didn't see it? Well, I've always been a, ear yeah, yeah. guy um but actually by going to see them live and and actually even before i saw them you know like the basic form of of eruption you know some guys were already doing that mm -hmm. and and in other in other places sort of like in south pasadena i mean oh okay yeah you know, yeah, yeah yeah terry yeah. kilgore well Maybe. yeah i mean and some other guys there was you know i don't want to drop names but there was guys that were older than me mm -hmm. that would we, you know, conglomerate at the either the sound chamber or in South Pasadena it was called Dean Brown Music, and then mm -hmm. in Alhambra it was Padrini Music, mm -hmm. and um, and uh, I remember I was very young. I was at Padrini Padrini Music, and in walks through the back door this brash guy that just had the like the the spiky kind of Rod Stewart, punky Peru hairdo or whatever, and that was Nick Panici. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah. and that meeting kind of kind of fueled that rock and roll thing for me. You know, yeah. T talk about your relationship with 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 Nick, and you know, these relationships. Obviously, in Pasadena, there's a, there's a a very interesting core of people that mm -hmm. that all had the same experience all were kind of in this this orbit of van halen you know talk about right. nick and your relationship and well well that's what i mean it's like nick walks in and he's just different you know he's way into the rock star thing you know mm -hmm. like we were just guitar guys you know and into the music he was into the scene you know into dressing the part and, and getting his way into the starwood or hanging out at a van halen rehearsal 
And basically, a lot of my first input was from Nick, you know, mm -hmm. definitely. And then, and then he's the one that introduced me to Mike Wolf. And then through Mike Wolf, I met Bro Bro, Doug Anderson, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. Denny Berry was another guy that was, you know, a rock guitar player around there. And then there was the Hunting Brothers. Who were they? Um, the twins okay. that lived Altadena, lived in Altadena. One played bass. I mean, they're still alive. One plays bass, one plays guitar. And then um, the guitar player, we, we, we would affectionately refer to him as Couch Van Halen. Couch Because he would sit there with his, I mean, probably still does to this day, <laughs> just hanging out at home in his stocking feet. He'd have like this bitchin' 69 Plexi 100 watt plugged into a cabinet just on 10, but he would take the cushions off of the couch and place them in front of the cabinet, you know, so it would lower the sound and muffle it, you know, quite a bit. But it would just be this runking chunk, just chunk fest. <laughs> and he's sitting there with a cigarette dangling out of his mouth at his parents' house. And, you know, and he was like, that was inspiring. You know, wow. he was very good at what he was doing, you know. That's, a, that's a and, my, that, Yeah, and he would hang out with Terry Kilgore as well. That's that's wild, you know, the, the, the amount of great players and bands you had in the area. Is there any other stories you want to tell me? Oh, sure, yeah. Tell, um, me, tell me another couple. Re regarding, uh, well, let's go back to that 4th of July. Okay, yeah. Because it, was, it wasn't just Eddie there. It was... Uh, Alex and Michael. So my drummer buddy was with me. Yeah. And and he was talking, you know, I mean, he was he would talk to Alex, right? I would want to talk to Edward. Um and when I wasn't paying attention at, at one point, he and Alex went in his Jeep to the Vons or Albertsons, whatever it was, the supermarket for a beer run. Oh yeah. Yeah. So my <laughs> drummer actually got to do a beer run with Alex Van Halen. Well, that was really cool. You know, Michael was a lot more low key, and we weren't really paying attention too much. Right. But um, there was a band called Cats and Dogs, and that had Dennis, which is Michael's younger brother. Okay. And they were being produced. I think. I think if they might have recorded at the Sound Chamber. You know, because the Sound Chamber music store ended up being yeah, a recording, recording studio, studio, which is is I think you're the one that told me this. Yeah. And then I researched that, and it's where Sheryl Crow recorded "All I Want to Do Is Have Some Fun." Yeah. yeah. Which is which is crazy, right? Right. But when I looked at the pictures on this on the producer's page, it, sure enough, man. I looked in those windows today, and I was like, that's the same room. I mean, it's, yeah. it's real obvious. It's a great studio because it's got really high ceilings mm -hmm. and, and a second room behind that wall, and it's right. perfect. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing that, that the, the sound chamber turned into the yeah. this recording studio. That has, you know, at least that. I'm sure there's more hits that came out of that. Right. Room. So so there was, um, you know, a, a cool scene going on. And, and, and when I was putting a band together to... Uh, go to Japan, um, I was hitting up Dennis, you know, Dennis Sobolewski or however it's pronounced. Yeah. Michael's Very hard to pronounce, but. Mike's brother. Anthony, you know. Right, right. Michael's brother. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, and I. I Sobolewski. Sobolewski. Yeah. So that's how we always say it, but it's got a W in there. So. Right. So, um, right. Uh, we're uh, like, I'm talking to Dennis and, and then somebody comes up to me and it goes, so. I hear you want to take my little brother to Japan, <laughs> you know. And there's Michael, and I'm all like, uh, uh, uh. Right, right. uh yeah. <laughs> he goes, ah, oh. and he like looks at me, kind of up and down. He had a he few brothers. He had a couple brothers, didn't he? Well, yeah, yeah I'm yeah. pretty sure, but I think. Oh, oh, but no. the, the, he played bass in the in the Cats and Dogs, and the funny thing was, is like in Pasadena, I don't know if I was walking or riding my bike or driving, whatever. Somehow. I bumped into this guy, and it was like right at the border between South Pasadena and Pasadena. And he either had like a sticker on his car or something. He was working at this place. He goes, yeah, I'm, I'm like the singer of this band called Cats and Dogs and stuff. And so so there's a band, um, John Gadesi. He ended up yeah. being like a 
well-known... Right, he's a bass player, right? No, guitar builder. Okay, oh, that was the yeah, other one. Yeah, so he, he made guitars for Yamaha, Fender, all sorts right, of stuff. Yes, yeah. He's still alive. Hi, John. Anyway, um, yeah. they were a really cool band, and they were like under Michael Anthony's wing and everything. Wow. And I remember he had like, there was a storage place where people, bands would rehearse. Rehearse, right. And, and it called uh, Space Bank. You can see it right off the 210 freeway. Anyway, he had a, a deal going on there back in the day. And wow. They had some cool songs, and, you know, I got their demo and everything. Yeah, so anyway. So what about, you know, um, I wanted to touch on Randy Rhodes because obviously he was the other one of the other guitar gods, George Lynch. Mm -hmm. The three of those guys, you know, did you have any view of them in the scene? Did you see them? Uh, actually, I saw Greg Leon yeah. in the Greg Leon Invasion when I was in Orange County. They played at uh, the local college, OCC, yeah. uh, where Scott Weiland actually went. Wow. And uh, so, and I remember looking at the back, you know, because you could walk behind and it said Arco Electronics, mm -hmm. you know. So his amp was maintained or modified by Jose Arredondo. Mm hmm. And one thing I wanted to mention about Jose is that I did get to bring my first plexi to him. And it was on the bench, and there was this piece of wood propping up the power transformer, you know, so it balanced properly. And I go, so this is where Edward's amp would sit? And that's the same piece of wood? And he goes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he would point at different things, like, because... Because it was a PA, a 67 PA head that yeah. I had. And he goes, well, you know, these are supposed to be 022s, and you have point ones, and there's an extra point six eight over here. So he would tell me... What's been modified. Yeah, and, and he basically said that Ed's head didn't have a master volume, didn't have an extra stage of gain. It was just a well-maintained stock high-gain lead spec. So it wasn't even any kind of variation inside of it? Well, you know, I've heard that <clears throat> where the point six eight goes on the uh, cathode on the second tube mm -hmm. was a hundred instead of a point six eight, which would let a lot more bass through. And but I also heard that in the phase inverter where there's like a forty seven pico, that it was a hundred pico. So that made more sense to me. So I tried that, and it actually cuts down a little bit of the ice pick so to me um putting in like a uh instead of a hundred where the 0.68 would be it's better to just go a little bit bigger maybe like a 1.5 or a three mm -hmm. and then put in the hundred in the the uh, phase inverter and that's a really cool sound go ahead and he was going to tell some stories about Lukather <laughs> and Van Halen. Yeah. So, go for it. Well, I, I used to go see uh, Steve play with Greg Matheson up, excuse me, up at the Baked Potato. Right. So we had talked quite a bit, and um, there was a guitar store named Voltage. Right. Some in, in Hollywood. Yeah, yeah. And I was there checking something out. And next thing you know, I hear this voice, hey, hey, Kurt, that sounds pretty good. I look, and it's Steve, you know, Luke, Luke, you know. Luke yeah. And um, so we, you know, I played a little more, and he played, and we talked, and he gave me his number, and we became friends, you know, at that point. And um, so then we, you know, I was at, I was living in Highland Park at the time, Mount Washington. And uh, I, I was buying and selling plexis a lot. You know, that kind of helped me pay the rent and stuff. So I had this super bass. And we're talking, and he, go, he was saying, like, yeah, I, I think I want to get a old Marshall, too, you know? And I go, hey, well, I've got this plexi super bass. And he's all, super bass? What's that? You know? So I kind of described it to him and said, oh, yeah, it's for sale. I got it. And he goes, oh, I'll think about it, whatever. And so that never materialized. But then 
I read in an article or, or heard somehow that, yeah, I got a, an old Plexi. It's a super bass. <laughs> you know? So I, I think I opened his eyes to that, you know. Well, it's, it's funny, you know, because you were, you were mentioning on our a little break that how, how when you were at this beach thing that you played the, the acoustic for Ed. Say, tell that story about the acoustic. Okay, well, so he, we're, me and my buddy were walking, you know, kind of dejected. It's like, oh, you know, Edward didn't want to hang out with us or whatever. And then I hear this voice, you know, hey, kid, let me see that thing. And so Edward plays... Uh, Spanish fly and eruption and stuff and and then afterwards so we're there just with our you know jaws down in the sand you know so to speak and okay one of you guys play you know and I was kind of more the shredder you know out right. of the two of us so right. so he goes well I'm not gonna so I, I do <laughs> so then I go well what am I gonna play you know in front of Eddie Van Halen you know the first thing so I had just figured out this this descending triplet arpeggiated thing uh, inspired by George Benson. Like I said, I was you know kind of inspired by George Benson and jazz players, Pat Martino. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I distinctly remember the first thing I played, and it's a descending triplet, kind of like an octave with a fifth, kind of doing this thing, and, um, and then you know just. I don't know how many months after that, because this is 4th of July. Mm -hmm. Now, we, we have to do, like, when was Fair Warning actually recorded? Right. But I believe the timeline works, you know? Okay. But when I got when the, I got the album, you know, right when it came out, <laughs> and then as soon as Dirty Movies comes on, I'm hearing... There's my lick. <laughs> He's playing my lick. I'm like, what? No way. He's going, diddle, 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 diddle. Right. The same thing, man. This is the thing in the intro where he's kind yeah. of tapping around right. or whatever, right? Yeah, and it's just like, whoa. You know, I might have copied like a thousand licks from him, but I think he might have copied one from me. <laughs> you know? Well, you never know. That's what we were just talking about. You know, the way that you kind of, you'll hear something, maybe even in passing, and then you, you'll... Not even oh, subconscious. Yeah, just don't it just kind of creeps in, right? And then yeah. the next thing you know, you're going, I don't know where I've heard that, but I like it. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it, it's kind of like when uh, Paul McCartney wrote yesterday. He goes, you know, what song is this? You know, I couldn't have really written this. You know, like it has to be something I heard. Right. And it's like, no, no, we've never heard that before. Right. Right. You know, but he swore that it was too good or something, you right, know, right. to be his own. Because you're, yeah, because you're always, you know, you're you're always thinking to yourself, did I, did I, did I lift this? Or, yeah. Right. You know, or, or like if you get down the road, like I did with the song I wrote, I was like, I played this figure on guitar, but then years later I realized that I had ripped it from a keyboard spot play a player ah. in a in a in a song. Well, that's always a great place to get inspiration from. Yeah, you know. Um, you remember the band Asia? Of course. There's a song that they this had this descending line, and 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 that just somehow it creeped into this song of mine, and I was like, later I was like, what? you know, it just finally came to me. I'm like, that's the. Yeah. <laughs> I grabbed that somehow. And, and I'm I'm still copying uh keyboard right. like what do you call it? Like a cliche or something, you know, the way piano mm -hmm. players when they rip, you know, the blues or whatever. Right. There's certain triplets and things that they do which work easily on the keyboard, which are kind of very difficult on guitar. That's you know? true. Yeah. Or, or like with Ed where he'd write on a, a piano and then yeah you know the suspended stuff like unchained or whatever you know he was writing that yeah. well switching, right switching yeah. around yeah. now how cool would it be if they had a recording of one of those recitals uh, right? that edward did when he was a kid in long beach you know? they, he he said that he has recordings not of that but like of other stuff when he was super young like whoa like guitar stuff i'm pretty sure and he said it would blow people's minds if he ever put it out. It was like really old, really old. I don't know if it was the piano stuff. Well, well, I want to um, mention that online you'll hear uh, this weird, distorted stuff, and it, and people are debating if it's really Eddie 
or not? The, the, this is the one where he's really young in his room bedroom. Well, it's yeah, they call it the bedroom tape or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And actually, that is Edward for sure because when we were doing the transfers at Mike Will's studio, mm -hmm. that was there, you know. Okay. And it's basically him plugged straight into a reel-to-reel -reel tape deck, probably Gary Nisley's, cranking the input for distortion. Okay. And uh, he's just like got his E string tuned down to A on that yeah, somebody yeah. get me a doctor thing. Yeah. And he's just coming up with riffs, you know? I remember that. I think I kept thinking this is you know, got to be the Fender that he had at home, but maybe you like you said. No, it's just straight yeah, into yeah. the tape deck. Well, that makes sense. And speaking of the Fender, you know, I I've, I've have a big collection of of vintage Fender amps, Basemans and Bandmasters mm -hmm. and Tremolux and and um you know, I saw that article where Edward talks about a 63 blonde bandmaster. Right, right. So I'd had a few of those, but none was quite, you know, I would play through the clean channel, not the vibrato channel, you know, the normal channel. Mm -hmm. But then I decided, hey, you know, I looked at the picture of his, and then I found one on Reverb, and I bought it, and it shows up. And sure enough, man, it's got so much gain and crunch. Really? It's unbelievable. Like well, people say that that there there was times when he only used that in the early days, number one, or cascaded with it into something. Well, I think the cascaded sound is obvious on "Gentlemen of Leisure" and uh, what's that other one? You know those those two super early ones. Yeah, I don't know all those. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> anyway, I, I don't have those. <laughs> it's it's super super distorted, super trebly. Right. And that's the sound you get when you take the Jazz output. Game. He probably took the output of the bandmaster on the external out and yeah. then into another amp. Right, right. Yeah. So to just kind of preempt it. Yeah, and it was super crunchy, super brittle, bright, and weird. Well, uh, the, this person told me on the side that, and somebody that might be on, that he went to a tech that Eddie brought his amps to. And the tech was told by Eddie how he was going about doing this cascading and the guy couldn't believe he was doing this but he claims i'm i'm just saying he claims that it was part of the first album sound and that's why van halen 2 sounds different than van halen 1 tonally what do you think nope you don't think so? <laughs> no? no that's what i was told no i mean if you yeah. listen to it it's basically his live rig yeah because you yeah. were there yeah. well yeah i mean it's his live rig i mean if you look you know he's got the the boss eq and he's yeah. got two different mxr eqs and, and different loop selectors it's but the tones in his hands i mean sure. i was there when he jammed with alan holsworth both times at the roxy and at git mm -hmm. and both times he used a stock roland 60 cube orange 112 and sounded like edward <laughs> That's you know? right, right. it's like you know, if you're a tone chaser or just a tone finder, you know, like, like I know, like, oh, speaking of which, which just kind of brings <laughs> you back to this thing, that same day in Laguna Beach, yeah. since it was 4th of July, there was this band playing, and me and my buddies and my drummer, we set in, you know, and played some songs, a couple of songs, and the rig I played through was like a PV amp with like this weird maestro pedal where the knobs were kind of on the side like this these giant knobs mm -hmm. anyway this guy's sound was not very great you know but i'd like turn all the knobs and get i got the sound you know mm -hmm. and everyone was saying man i can't believe you got that sound out of that amp and i go well you know you just got to know what you're doing you know and then the funny thing was is the guy actually you know complimented me and you know what he did the first thing he did put all his setting back all his settings back to where they were before because that was his comfort zone okay you know even though you know right. if it was me i would have just left it th that way you know right right but it's all about your ears what you hear yeah i mean you know it's basically you deal with what you have right. available to you and you just try to get your what feels right to you right like when i'm touring and i'm going through backline amps you know mm -hmm. I'll set the amp, you know, to get a clean sound, not a, not a, Sterile. like kind of a crunch, right. but a big sound. Big sound, right. 
and I'll go from there. You know what I mean? Right. And then use pedals and stuff. But get your, get your... instead of just like, right. how much gain can I get out of the amp, and then turn the, use the master volume, kind of like the amp is the power section. Right. You know? Right. Like and the tone comes more from the pedal board. Right. Actually. When you're doing that kind of stuff. Yeah. Mm, that's crazy. Stuff. Well, I appreciate you getting with us, man. And okay. Hanging out. We're gonna. I guess we're gonna play some guitars now. Yeah. Make some noise, maybe. Let's do it. Let's do it. Well, that's Kurt James, y'all. Thanks for, for uh, tuning in, and we'll see you on the next one. Rock on. All right, thanks.